Ben Hogan, former national staffer turned government relations consultant Georgie Stiliano. Thanks for coming along. And Dr Stephen Noakes, who is a senior lecturer in politics and international relations at Auckland University. Lots to talk about. I'm just going to deal with the teal wave first, guys. Uh, Georgie, I mean, why do you think they had so much of an impact this election? I mean, incredible to watch, right? And I think just shows Liberal government becoming too conservative over time, too out of touch. And this is a real no to pale male stale. And <laughs> fantastic to, to see these affluent, educated women. And I'm all for it. Because so, Aussie politics is known for being a bit of a bear pit. I mean, could it make it a bit more bearable? I hope so. I hope so. I mean, Australia is um, backwards on climate change. They have been backwards in um, treatment of Indigenous people and women. Um, I really hope to see this, this rattle the cage. Yeah, it's like Scott Morrison gone, Finn, face of Australian politics changing. I mean, if you could say the passing of power between one middle-aged white guy <laughs> to another middle-aged white guy is a change, yeah, sure. Yeah. But no, I think the surging of the independence is the real story here, and it just shows there is this growing dissatisfaction with centrist parties that are entrenched and lob power back and forth between each other yep. and never ad ad address acute yep. crises like climate change. And I think this is going to be reflected around the world, and we're going to see this with independent parties. Why right don't now. we have independence here? I mean, is anybody got an opinion on that one? I mean, I, this is definitely, to, to your mm, point, mm. Finn, this is a bit of a... People are disenfranchised with a two-party system. Mm, mm. We do have important roles for minor parties. We're seeing that already over here. The Greens and ACT particularly. New Zealand First has obviously been in that position. So I think... I'm not sure if we could carry independence. We're a, we're a small country, um, but it'd be interesting to see, right? Yeah, yeah. OK, well, it's going to be fascinating. It could happen. Let's move on to the big picture of China. So China's making its power play into the Pacific at the moment. Um, the, the PM's touring the US and China is touring the Pacific, Stephen. What's at stake here? I think what you're really seeing is growing geostrategic competition in the region between uh, China as the, the new player and, and some of the, the more established uh, players in the region, um, including the United States. And in principle, what I think you could see is that kind of competition putting pressure on smaller and middle players uh, ac across the region to bandwagon with one side or the other. Right. And do you think there's a temptation for these the, the small players that China's targeting right now, the 10 nations, for them to bandwagon with China? Certainly, yeah. Uh, China's a different kind of, of player in, in a lot of ways. And uh, regarding its aid program, will fund certain things that traditional donors across the Pacific uh, will not, and in ways they will not. So certainly there's, there's a carrot there. Yeah, there is a carrot. Is it the beginning of a change of order in our backyard, so, to use another word? Potentially, yes. Yeah. But, but, but I mean, what, kind, what can China offer these nations that would tempt them to do it? Partly, it's, it's about the nature of, of the aid program mm. um, and, and the sorts of things uh, which the PRC has proven willing to fund, large infrastructure projects which mm. traditional aid donors <laughs> will not. Mm. Um, it's, it's quite rare, for example, that uh, Canberra or Wellington would, would fund the construction of an airport mm. or yes. something like yeah. that. Yeah, it's direct funding, isn't it? Mm. <laughs> I, just, I mean, we also need to remind ourselves, though, that these are sovereign nations, mm -hmm. and um, I don't think that vesting interest in fisheries is going to go down with proud Pacific people. I mean, that is an incredibly important topic for them, and there's a guardianship there. Um, and I would like to see that you have Pacific Island residents themselves pushing back on this. I don't think it's just a fait accompli because China's come along and said, hey, here's some cheap cash and some infrastructure. It is certainly true that there's quite a lot of variation in attitudes towards China across the region. There right. are reasons that we talk about the Pacific in the way we talk about the Pacific, but it's not all one place that acts it's or thinks all It's not homogenous, right? Way, no. It's not a homogenous... Uh, and so uh, I just wanted to say as well, you touched on mining in that interview with Winston Peters, and yeah. I think that's a really interesting area because China's played a very clever game over the last 10 years. They predicted the electrification of everything a long time ago and have been buying up cobalt mines, copper mines, lithium mines, mm -hmm. and they now control a large amount of the supply chain there. There's a lot of copper in the Pacific, and a lot of it is in the seafloor, but seafloor mining is now starting to ramp up. So I think this is part of the strategy. While they can't get to it yet, over the next decade, mm. it's, a it's a massive mm. resource strategy. Mm. OK, so uh, Winston Peters, you mentioned just there, he is very critical, Georgie, of uh, the current foreign minister mm. and our government at the moment, dropping the ball, basically. Have they dropped the ball? Yeah. 
I, I agree with Winston on this one. Um, I think that, I mean, Penny Wong, third day in the job, she's... The she's Australian over, Foreign Minister, Yes, yeah. yes, and I, I do wonder... Of course, we've had COVID. Of course, the last two years, travel has been difficult mm. and diplomacy mm. has had to operate um, over email. But she should be there, and I think we need to be focusing a lot more on Pacific travel. I did hear from a, a beehive source this week that ministers have been told to prioritise Pacific travel. So I would hope that in coming days we start seeing some media releases. This is... OK. This is... But, the, the Stephen, I, I would say that the contrast between Nanaya Mahuta and Penny Wong, who's over there splashing the cash right now, is quite a contrast, isn't it, in, in terms of their approach? Yeah, but one of the things that I think you've heard from uh, the minister here that you may not have heard in, in years past is that there's going to be an emphasis, or New Zealand to needs to place more emphasis on not having all our eggs in a single basket. Yeah. Um, I'm actually quite comfortable with that perspective. For a, a small country, um, remotely placed in a geographic sense, Diversification mm. is good, in my mind. Sure. And so, I mean, are you talking about, you know, our free trade policy with China yeah. and being so dependent on that? That's right. Yeah. And so they have got a, a trade, sort of a diversification agenda on the, on the go with, like, free trade agreements in the EU uh, underway with the UK. So that is underway. But in terms of the Pacific particularly, um, have we really dropped the ball? I think that there's been, uh, or needs to be, um, Greater recognition, um, as was said, sovereignty has to mean sovereignty everywhere. There's a tendency, I think, sometimes for us to talk about the Pacific as if it's our backyard, yeah. which maybe isn't quite the right message to send. These right. are sovereign nations full of proud people with their own perspectives on things, and that deserves greater airtime. Mm. Right. So it's not, a, it's, not a, it's not a foregone conclusion that China's just going to sweep through the Pacific and sign everybody yeah. up. Certainly not. Yeah. Okay. But we need to be a good friend, not just one who That's choppers right. in and then choppers back out. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, let's just move on to Jacinda Ardern uh, in the US on her on a tour. She was at Harvard this week, Finn, um, calling out the social media giants over misinformation. Um, can we expect change from that kind of speech? Look, I think everyone agrees with Ardern in the general sense that misinformation is a problem. But as soon as you ta start talking specifics, it gets really problematic really quickly. Policing speech is really hard. Look at, what, look at here. We can't even get hate speech legislation out yeah, the door because no one agrees what it is. Look at the Christchurch call. Defining extremist content is very difficult. Enabling any institution or any government to say what is and isn't true is an absolute nightmare. I think you've got to go the other way and look at the practical applications you can do within social media giants to stop content going viral in a dangerous way. You can just add a little bit of friction to the system by making it harder to retweet things. Mm. Just literally just adding an extra box to check. Get rid of the endless scroll algorithm. Demonetize things between 12 and 6 a.m. Remove the business incentive to have people on right, so all this, day, this, every day. This is, your, this is your plan, right? Okay. Just call me your time. <laughs> yeah, OK, but um, well, I'll, I'll get Elon to give you a call. But um, she's going for the top level. She's going off to Seattle to talk to the tech execs and, and, and just go at the top level and say, you need to do something about that. I mean, we've seen that with Christchurch Call, Georgie. Is it going to make any difference? No. <laughs> OK. No. And I, I also, as much as I thought his, his speech at Harvard was, was cracking, I mean, what a momentous occasion. Mm. I mean, pretty light on substance in terms of algorithms and development. And it was... Um, I kind of was left thinking, what does that mean? Mm. And I think to Finn's mm. point, mm. We, we're we having a hard time with it. And I also know that the tech companies themselves, for the most part, have been quite comfortable with regulation of content. And their kind of line has been, you tell us what your local laws are and we'll follow them. Yep. So is it the... the the tech companies existentially, is it their role to play judge, jury, executioner exactly. over content? Right. And at the end of the day, Facebook has three billion users. They've got a market cap four times our entire GDP. There's a power differential <laughs> we're never going to get over. So okay. we're not exactly going to crack the whip. Can I just yeah. one last thing before we wrap this up? Speaking of power differentials, uh, so Jacinda Ardern's going to meet somebody called Joe Biden at the, the place never in the White House. <laughs> never heard of him. Um, uh, Stephen, she's, she probably talked trade, but she probably talked China and the Pacific. I mean, is he going to be interested in her talking about China and the Pacific? I would think that there would be at least some receptivity to, to talk of that sort. I mean, there's just been the, the announcement of the Indo-Pacific Economic mm -hmm. Framework. Um, certainly there would be some common ground for the two of them. Okay. And on the same day, I should point out that she meets Joe Biden. Uh, K-pop supergroup BTS is going to be there as well. Who's going to be the most popular? I'm not exactly my area, unfortunately, Simon. Yes. I literally have never heard of that until this second. Oh, okay, so go. boring. Oh, my God. Oh, my gosh. Cool. You guys are really disappointed me on that one. Oh, no. And with that disappointment, I'm going to lend the panel. Stephen, uh, Georgie and Finn, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Still to come from Beijing and San Francisco, 